James, yeah. also from VMware Tanzu Labs. Yeah, so we are software engineers from Tanzu Labs, where extreme programming is one of our core disciplines. Oh wait, I need to talk into this, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, today the talk that we're going to give is about extreme programming. And uh, I don't know like if it's something that everyone has heard of. Maybe you've tried it before. Maybe you're even practicing XP. Hopefully, like, uh, regardless of where you are in that journey, like, you'll find something useful to take home from today's talk. Yeah. yeah, so maybe just a quick show of hands. Like, how many of you have heard of extreme programming before? Like, yes, no, <laughs> cool, yeah, so I see some. And like the follow-up question would be like, for those of you who have heard of extreme programming before, what do you typically associate with it? Like if I told you like extreme programming, what would be the first thing that comes to your mind? Test-driven development. Okay, test-driven development. Any other ideas? Programming. Pair programming, yeah. I think those are typically the things that uh, immediately come to mind when we talk about extreme programming, right? The things that we actually do and practice as uh, extreme programming uh, practitioners. Yeah. So uh, what we like to talk about today goes a bit below the surface to uh, what uh, guides what we do as extreme programming uh, practitioners, which is the values. Yeah, so so what is XP? XP is a lightweight methodology, methodology for small to medium-sized teams uh, developing software in the face of vague and rapidly changing requirements. Uh, it was a set of methodology that was developed by Ken Beck while he was working on a project for Chrysler in 1994. Uh, he uh, developed that methodology, used it in the project, and then um, uh, I guess wrote a book about it, uh, which came out in 1999. This is the original, the first edition of the book. Uh, and um, why, why is it called extreme programming? Uh, it's called extreme programming because it takes a bunch of good practices, uh, commonly recognized good practices in programming, and uh, take them to the extreme. So for example, uh, a lot of times we feel that uh, testing is important. So then, because without te with tests, we can guarantee the, uh, the, the software that we develop have quality. Uh, there isn't bugs, there isn't regression. And um, to take that to the extreme, we say, okay, their tests are important. So then that's not only write them all the time, we also write them first. So we wouldn't even start writing the first actual programming code for your app until we have tests. And that, that is taking that testing to the extreme. And we also see that, you know, another example will be uh, code review. Code review is important. How do we take that to extreme? We do that all the time. So then that's where uh, pair programming comes from. So pair programming is that, it, uh, it's like when we have um, two people uh, working on the same piece of code, one computer, uh, two sets of mouse and keyboard, and then the code, code review will happen continuously as the feature gets developed. Uh, next one. So yeah, so uh, earlier we mentioned pair programming and test-driven development are the some most mo two of the most notable uh, practices for extreme programming. However, um, practices are really like ice ex for XP. Like it's just really more like iceberg where the tip of that iceberg is the practices. Most people usually only see that. However, why do we do such practices? Uh, uh, to the reason why we do these practices are actually to accomplish the key XP values, the values that we want to accomplish uh, that, um, that will uh, help to accomplish the goal of having high quality software and be able to move them as fast as possible. Between the values and the pr practices, that's the principles such as embrace change, keep the things simple, uh, that's acts as the bridge between the practices and the values. And these are <coughs> cool. So uh, maybe let's talk a bit about the extreme programming practices. So yeah, actually, I didn't want to like show this like just yet. Like uh, before going into that, I think 
if you are asked to come up with a group of values that uh, maybe could possibly guide a team of software engineers in uh, producing quality software effectively. I think typically the kind of things that you would think about are maybe things like, uh, okay, like we value quality, or maybe like we value like clean code, uh, reliability, scalability, things like that, right? So uh, it might surprise you, or it does at least for me, that when you talk about extreme programming values, a lot of these actually don't really have much that much to do with writing code, or uh, like they're not really just technical things. They are more to do about how we work together with each other on a team to produce software together. And so, yeah, that brings us to the first value, communication. So it's kind of hard to be able to like uh, work on a team and build software together without effective communication, right? Like communication is how you find out like what needs to be built. It's how you collaborate with uh, other engineers on a team to uh, come up with ideas, come up with designs, and actually implement them to build something, right? So the first XP value that we have is communication. And uh, if you go back to a lot of the XP practices they've talked about, like pair programming, uh, uh, maybe working on cross-functional teams, all these are things to uh, promote and facilitate communication between different people who are involved in the activity of producing software. Uh, the second one we have is simplicity. So this is maybe the most like technical one, if you would. So what is, what is simplicity? It's, I would say first, like simplicity is not doing what is easiest. It is, there's a difference between what is easy to do and what is simple. So uh, when I say simple, it means like it's not a complex solution. It's very straightforward, easy to understand. And this is typically relative to like the job at hand, right? So. When, let's say, uh, I'm trying to solve a problem, there are many different solutions that I could possibly consider. Uh, what we typically try to go for is the simplest solution, because that's something that would be maintainable in the long run. It would be easier for other people to understand later on, and even ourselves in the future when we come back to this piece of code we have written. And that's not necessarily always the easiest thing to do. It can be quite easy to just you know, quickly come up with the first solution that comes to mind that may be more complex, Sometimes we can be tempted also to try to build a solution that caters for use, many use cases that may or may not ever happen, right? And that uh, results in introducing unnecessary complexity to, into our systems. So the second XP value is about trying to keep our code simple uh, for our sake, for the sake of other people that we work with, and just in general to minimize waste. Yeah. So. Uh, Building good software uh, requires feedback on many different levels, right? So uh, it can happen within a team, also outside of, of a team, right? And like some examples of uh, feedback, uh, maybe today I'm working with James on a feature and like uh, I feel like, hey, maybe uh, uh, I might ask James for feedback on how I'm working together with him. So maybe things like, oh, how do you find the pace? Like, that's why I'm saying makes sense, things like that, right? So we may exchange like feedback on the level of pair. Within a team, it might be between like different disciplines. For example, we frequently work with designers and product managers. So sometimes it could be things like uh, helping a designer to see that maybe what they've designed is actually not so easy to implement and there could be better alternatives, right? So we frequently give feedback to our teammates as well in uh, service of building a better product. And another like uh, kind of feedback we have is outside of the team with maybe our stakeholders or even our customers and users, right? Uh, nobody wants to build a piece of software that doesn't end up getting used. Uh, typically, we want to make sure that we're getting uh, feedback from users to find out, like, are they using the, what we've built? Are they using it how we've expected them to use it? How, how is the process going for them? Right? So that's another like, form of feedback uh, within the team. And it's kind of important for us, right, uh, if we are trying to keep things simple, that we have feedback, right? Because, uh, well, it's very hard for us to be able to guess upfront what we need to build. <clears throat> Typically, how we do that is by keeping things simple and then through feedback, like learning more and 
building on our products incrementally, right? So feedback is pretty like central to the way we work in extreme programming. Yeah. Uh, and then the last two uh, values are kind of more like interpersonal things. So the first one would be respect, right? So typically on the team, we will be working with many different people. Uh, it could be people of like different roles, right? Maybe product managers or designers. Uh, it could be people of different like uh, backgrounds or level experience, right? So I think the reason why respect is such a key value to have is because you want to make sure that we can work effectively with p different people, even though they may not necessarily like think the same always as we do, right? So respecting each other means like listening to someone else's ideas and not just like ignoring them. It means like uh, maybe helping them to get better instead of complaining about them and criticizing them. And it's not it's, it's not always an easy thing to do, but I think it's something that's key and foundational to being able to work together as a team. And the last one we have uh, is courage. Yeah. So uh, what does courage have to do with software development? It can come up in like, many different like, situations. So definitely, like, <clears throat> if I'm an engineer pairing with someone else, uh, that can take courage, right? Because uh, sometimes it may feel like, oh, this other person that I'm working with can see all my flaws, my mistakes that I'm making, right? That's not always something that's so easy, right? Uh, it could be in terms of maybe telling your product manager or your stakeholders that uh, maybe uh, something that they want by a certain time can't actually be done. Or that maybe like, hey, you know, we, we spoke to our users and customers and that uh, like really shiny feature that you thought we really needed, like actually like nobody actually needs that, right? Those are all like difficult things to do and like that requires courage. So one thing to mention is that <clears throat> all these values, they kind of reinforce and like counterbalance each other, right? So imagine like if we had courage on its own and we just like did everything courageously uh, with no feedback, then maybe that might result in like not so like desirable outcomes also, right? So these like five values, they kind of work together, they uh, facilitate each other. You can't have like feedback without communication, for example but they also balance each other uh, so that we can work effectively together as a team. Yeah, yeah and now going back to the um, XP practices. So pair programming, these I already mentioned quite a bit, but uh, in terms of um, how the different values together uh, for, uh, guides us on how we do pair programming. Pair programming, uh, what it is is that you have two developers in, I guess, one computer. There's actually only one computer that's hidden in the monitor there, uh, behind the monitor there. And so they're actually working on the same computer, on the same uh, piece of software, using two sets of keyboards, mouse, and monitors. And what they do in pair programming, what we do in pair programming, is that we would uh, do constant code review. We would... Um, uh, discuss the ideas, the um, architecture, the design decisions before we start implementing most of the time. Sometimes, you know, we want to do experiments. One person might say, okay, there are some ideas that I want to do. I will need to explore a little bit. I might not be able to verbalize it first. Let me just, you know, drive for a bit, code for a bit, and now explain. But most of the time, the pairs need to be, you know, think as one. They need to know what each other's doing, what problems each other are most likely facing, and then together uh, they work on the same piece of software. And f of course, from that, that means communication is very important. If it's just two people sitting together, one person staring at the screen, the other person's typing, that's not pair programming. And uh, in terms of uh, feedback, yeah, so constant code review. Like I make a typo, I did something completely wrong, my pair should tell me. And then for my pair to tell me, well, they need to do that in a resp respectful manner. If they are rude about it, you know, I might not listen. So then that also doesn't make for very productive pair programming. And then in terms of um, courage, of course, if I'm pairing, it's my first day on the team, I'm pairing with someone a lot more senior, I might be a bit afraid to voice my concerns. But then, you know, something that I've done before 
or um, something that you know for some reason I do know, but then my pair because he's busy pairing, he's busy coding, he's not able to see that. So then, for as a pair, I need to have that courage to raise it up. Uh, and simplicity, actually. So um, when we do have two pairs working together, discussing out things, uh, we generally, from our experience, we actually generally come up with simpler designs. Because sometimes you're on, in your own rabbit hole, you're just, okay, let me chase after one feature or one implementation after another. You know, before I know it, I, you know, the original ticket or story, feature story says I need to do this, but I ended up doing 10 different things all at once. That's very possible. And, um, and however, uh, when we do that, there, there's a problem. Like if we do go too far, we're not simple, we might come up with overly complex design, which has a lot of potentially edge cases we don't consider. In that case, then um, you know, we dug a hole for ourselves, right? So um, because uh, something that's really simple, maybe you can go with a more simpler design, but you go with a lot more complex things. And then that potentially lead to more bugs. Uh, so that's one. The other thing is that if the, the feature only calls for some small functionality, but then I build up a lot more, uh, the risk we run into there is that um, the world is rapidly changing, you know, requirements could change. Something that needs to we thought we need to do next week might not be the case when next week comes. And so we always want to only focus on what we currently need to do that's set up by the product managers. And if we do a bit more, then, you know, we all know pandemic came. Uh, I'm pretty sure that ruined the product roadmap for a lot of companies. And if they had, you know, ignored some of that feedback, they just built a lot of crazy things ahead of time and they don't get feedback from the market, then uh, a lot of wasted work had to be shelved temporarily or even permanently. Uh, Test-driven development uh, is uh, the other practice where, um, yeah, so f when we write tests, uh, it gives us feedback on the quality of the code that we complete. So that's the feedback aspect. Uh, from tests, um, a lot of times when you are a little bit more experienced in writing tests, uh, you actually be able to use tests as documentation uh, to uh, from the test cases, you can know that given X, Y, Z input, we get A, B, C output. And that helps you understand what the piece of code, the uh, application code does. And these kind of documentation uh, is, uh, is a better form of docu documentation than static documents because these tests, when they fail, uh, that means the, they need to be fixed immediately. So then in that case, then you have always up-to-date tests as documentations. Uh, and then with tests, it actually gives you courage to add new features because sometimes you know, I'm adding a small piece of functionality to a complex code base. Who knows when I break anything? When you have tests, when you do uh, test-driven developments from day one, you now have a very comprehensive test that, you know, if I run this test, this test suite, if they pass, then I know my application will behave as it's intended to. So then when I add a new feature through TDD, uh, my, the test, the new test I added, it passed, and then all the other tests, if they also pass, then that means all the old features still work. Uh, yeah, and then I guess the other thing is uh, maybe I'll just touch on simplicity a little bit as well. Um, so like earlier, we said that pair programming could help us come up with simpler designs. Uh, test room development also does actually, because um, the, the cycle of test driven development is that you will first write a failing test. Uh, you know what you need to build, you write that test first, and then you um, actually implement the code to make the test pass, and then you look at, oh, I make the test pass, but maybe I can improve the design. Then that the third step is refactor. So red green refactor is a TDD, common TDD cycle that we follow. Uh, and this is meant as, a, when we do this TDD cycle with unit tests, it's supposed to, you know, we're, we're supposed to, uh, for the most part, being able to run through these cycles more than once or twice a day. And then 
uh, if for some reason my tests are very difficult to write, um, or uh, a piece of a test, or, or if I'm not running TDD cycle, I'm not, uh, I am not, I'm writing code not making the existing test pass, that means something goes wrong, right? So if I have a test that's very difficult to write, very complex to write, maybe I'm doing too much. Maybe I need to break it down further to figure out the next, next piece of level of more appropriate small task to do. Um, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, anything else for TDD? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, then, um, okay. So if we are to do test driven development from day, day one of a uh, application, then we actually will have a lot of tests. But these tests, if you don't run them, then you don't actually get feedback on them because tests only work when you run them and see the feedback from them. You see that, you know, there's test breaking or whatnot. And um, that's where it, continuous integration comes in. So, and when we have a team of developers that have multiple, a team of multiple developers uh, working on the same piece of code, everyone is adding tests. And then uh, how do we continuously run them, integrate the code together, make sure the uh, old and the new tests always pass? We have a, we'll use a CI CD pipeline. And if you see here, uh, that's our uh, internal tool called Concourse, which is a CI CD tool similar to that of uh, GitLab. Jenkins and GitHub. And uh, yeah, so in addition to that, um, not only do we use that pipeline to do continuous integration, we also use that to do continuous delivery. Delivery meaning deploying to a uh, more production-like environment. It could go straight to production or it could go to a production-like environment, but not, necessar not necessarily production. Um, the exact process really depends on each uh, organization, how they want to gate the process of deploying to production. Um, yeah, and then lastly, we, but not least, like we, we can talk a bit about cross-functional team. Cross-functional team is a very important aspect of uh, extreme programming. Uh, we would, the, when we say cross-functional, the most common example would be engineers, developers, product developers, sorry, pro uh, developers, product designers, and product managers. And, uh, and what we believe strongly is that these uh, members need to work together and their the barriers of communication between them needs to be minimized because when the team uh, can communicate effectively, they get uh, better feedback. So for example, as engineers, I'm not developing something that is super ugly. That is, you know, I could be coding according to mockup, but then uh, somehow I read the mock-up wrong and then it ended up not being correct. Uh, or uh, like I get the product requirements from my product manager but then you know, misread something and then I don't want to send an email to us. Because sometimes in the traditional model you could be doing outsourcing, you could have uh, emails that goes through and you know, it could be different time zones, it could be different regions. Uh, when you have long communication path um, barriers there, uh, the features get become slower to develop, and mis when miscommunication happens, then um, the there will be bugs in the in the future. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything? Else? Okay. Cool. All right. And now we're going to talk about something that you can probably you can try if you have some time. So these are some small experiments with XP. We would like to. Um, challenge you to pair with another engineer on your team for a day. What that means is that you, know, you will be uh, using the same computer, developing a feature together. And then you'll be a, uh, and you would, can take turns writing and reviewing codes on the fly. So taking turns meaning at some point, you're the one that is taking control of the keyboard and mouse, you're typing most of the time continuously for a little bit, and then your pair will be the one that's reviewing your code and giving you real-time code review feedback. Uh, and then after a bit, you rotate, and that, that's something that you can try to get a sense of what pair programming is like. Uh, next is uh, to explore unit testing framework. 
for your favorite programming language. Uh, I would say at this point, all programming languages have some kind of test unit testing framework, at least most of the more popular programming languages. And I'll challenge you to um, try and think of when you work on new features on the project that you're working on to, before you write that first piece of code, to think about what tests you want to write. What are the test cases? And try to use that testing framework to write those tests. And lastly, um, uh, challenge you to exchange feedback, because feedback is very important for XP. Really, all the practices link back to feedback. And so um, you're, when you're working with someone, we challenge you to exchange feedback with that someone that you're working with. And uh, the, one of the simplest framework, not simplest, one of the key framework that we uh, follow will be um, the task framework, which is uh, a timely, actionable, specific, and kind feedback. So what that means is that you know, we want to give feedback on a timely basis. It's not like two, three months from now or half a year from now. Uh, the, the feedback needs to be actionable. Um, it's not like I'm just complaining, but it's ideally if I can have something that I can suggest for someone to do, uh, you need to be specific about what you're giving feedback on. And uh, of course, remind you to be kind. It's, um, when we give feedback, we want to help each other grow. And if you don't give feedback in a way people can listen, then you're just venting and it's not really that productive. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, in co uh, congrats on making it to the end. In conclusion, like uh, yeah, that what we do as engineers, like that's dictated by what we value as engineers. What we value as like engineering teams, and like what we get from XP, right? Like we shared a set of values and practices. These are not by any means like the only things that are ever available in the whole world, or the only practices that can 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 be conducive to like good software development, but. We do find that it's like a good starting point and a set of values and practices that help to reinforce each other to help us get better at it. Yeah. And like so why bother understanding the XP values, right? Like maybe I can pair program, maybe I can like do T D D all great. Uh but I think what you don't really uh well what you maybe you miss if you don't understand the values behind XP is like how do you try to convince someone to like adopt these values, right? Or even like sometimes context changes, right? So let's say uh, pandemic comes one day, like we can't like uh, pair program like we used to in the office, right? Uh, understanding XP values like helps us to maybe modify and adapt these practices to different contexts, right? And uh, that helps us to do it in a way without compromising in the, on the values, right? So maybe like now that we are remote or working hybrid, it can be harder to like uh, pair all the time, right? So what are the other things that we can do to kind of make sure that we're still getting the communication that we need or the feedback we need, right? Understand the, understanding the XP values kind of helps us to make sure that we are getting like uh, what we need out of what we do as a team. So if you are interested in learning more about XP, uh, these are a couple of books uh, maybe you can look to. So I think there's one on the left, Extreme Programming Explained. Uh, just now, uh, James shared, showed like that the first edition, this is the second edition, uh, which probably you can find on like Amazon, like everywhere. Yeah. And then there's another like book, uh, both, both actually are like back. So the second one is more about test-driven development. So uh, yeah. I think it is called a mindset shift, so uh, maybe it's something they can work through by example to get a sense of. Yeah. So both books are by Ken Beck. Uh, we don't like earn commission from selling his books, but yeah, at least I don't. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, we tried to keep some time at the end for some questions and answers. I don't know, like, do we have time for that? Cool. Yeah, and like even if you don't have a question, like we would, it would be helpful to us if you could help to scan the. QR code and like fill in a very quick and short feedback survey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. question. Yeah. Um, how how can you prevent pair programming like, from being like an information dump when there are two engineers of different like knowledge, domain knowledge, or skill ability? Because I'll give you an example. It's like uh, like someone was pairing on a DevOps task who's never done DevOps. You know? So how how do you prevent it from just being one side of information dump and to maintain the you know the interesting interactivity of pair programming? <coughs> The one with the disparity, will still feel engaged, 
Who okay? <clears throat> so yeah, just to repeat the question, like how, like let's say if a situation where there are two people of different skill levels like pairing together, how do you make sure it's not just like information dump and like keep it interactive? Like I think probably there are things that both people can do uh, as a like if I'm the one in a junior position, right? Uh, probably I want to think about what questions I can be asking to learn what I need to learn, right? So it's not just like passive. I'm waiting for someone to like uh, feed me, or I just like watch like what they're doing, right? So I think like if you're the if you're the person in that position, maybe you can think about what uh what kind of questions you can be asking your pair to actually learn uh what you don't know, right? And then I think like if you're the other one with more knowledge, right, then um I think uh I think yeah probably like sometimes some patience is needed because like uh, the other person they are pairing with may not know everything that you already do. Um, probably one thing I try to do is to give the other person chances to drive, right? So it may like slow things down a bit, but I think that would be more effective and conducive for the other person to learn, right? So not just like I'm telling you everything, but uh, maybe like step by step, I could be like uh, maybe breaking things down so that the other person can try one thing and then maybe I can like we we try we try to like take turns, right? We don't want it to just be one person driving all the time. So maybe like we could let you could let like the junior like uh drive on like simpler things and then like maybe take over like for something more complex but still like provide the kind of like explanation enough for them to get the job done. Don't explicitly tell them what to do, Uh it depends, right? <laughs> so um uh I think sometimes uh, I mean, different people, like maybe some people will be able to figure out if you give them a few pointers, right? Other people, if they're really completely new to the area, like they may just need that help and guidance, right? So I think you probably got to like figure out where your pet is at also, and like as you work with them, see what's the most effective way of working with them. Yeah. Yeah. I think the like, context of this is very important. So, one is that is this pairing a uh, temporary arrangement? Because sometimes it might happen, right? Like, you know, two people have different, slightly different contexts. When you pair them together, you can solve a very important task that needs to be solved now. That's why we have that. We're pairing. And then in that case, then, you know, the, we need to keep the party in mind. Like, we provide enough context so that two people can, like, the more senior person provide enough context um, so that the two people can work together to resolve the problem ahead. And then after that, then maybe, you know, we can do whiteboarding session. There are different ways we can try to explain the information. Yeah. And, but if, if it is a long-term pairing that, you know, we have someone new that's switching into the team, then I think the more senior person or like if there are more than one senior person on the team together, we can see, okay, what, what, what is the most important thing to focus on first? You know, we don't want to do like information dump sometimes is required, but then if you do that much information dump for someone new, they're not going to learn. So you're going to need to repeat them anyway. So then in that case, then you uh, maybe we just walk through the architecture, do a whiteboarding session, and then uh, provide just enough detail for the current task at hand as well. Like we do believe pair programming is still at the end of the day pair uh, programming. So then you got to program. It's not about talking hours and hours and not really doing anything. Um, and in terms of what not we tell the people to do, to do what they do, like I think it depends on how people learn. Because sometimes people say, well, I, I learn by doing, please tell me what to type, and then you know we can do it that way. Uh, sometimes we do actually intentionally want the newer people to do more things hands-on, and then where the more senior person can explain, but then the execution is what mostly the newer person to drive. So that, that's how they learn, like you, know, you do by learning. But you know, sometimes people don't learn that way. That's fine too. That's for the peer to decide. Yeah. It is, it is. It's like feedback. So, you know, if something doesn't work, try something else. Uh, communication, talk about, you know, that's my learning style. Right? Thank you very yeah. much. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, I have one question. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Hmm? Uh, my question is from the TDD side. So, um, not all the logic and the context is always in one piece of software or a service or a code base. Like in current systems, there are different teams and different geographies. And it's not always possible to handle all the context in your code. 
code like you you can write the test for your code mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. but like if it, like for example if it's an event driven system you emit something <coughs> how the downstream server because of your changes mm -hmm. might get affected is also your responsibility to some extent like you cannot just emit something which breaks the other system i see so tdd i understand that part where it's related <coughs> to the context of your code your code is documented well through your test but how about this uh, Way where uh, your, some of your event or some of your data, the context is actually distributed to other services. Right. So that part is never tested. Or how extreme programming and TDD tackles this behavior when the context is stored distributed through multiple services and teams. I see. I see. So um, <coughs> let me see if I understand your question correctly. So uh, I'm gonna just say also for the recording. But uh, yeah. So the um, you're thinking of a situation where uh, there's a, I guess, larger scale application where there are um, a lot of different components or services, microservices uh, or applications, and then the business logic uh, actually, or logic in general, are spread out across multiple. And then in this case, maybe as an application team, we're doing TDD, our code is tested, but it's the whole system together that's providing value for the user and how do we provide um, quality assurance or how do we test for that. Um, I, I, I think um, there are definitely, first of all, there are different types of tests we can have. So then even as a team, let's say you, it, it could be a situation where let's say I'm doing TDD, I'm actually, as a team or as multiple teams, I always do TDD, but I do have that same situation you're in where I have one application does something, the other application does something else, together provides the holistic uh, uh, value for the user. In that case then, like you could have unit tests for your application, you could have integration tests uh, for your uh, application, you can have um, uh, service tests for your application, but then beyond that you could have a almost like a multiple system integration tests. I forgot what the name is. Con contract test, maybe that's across, that's sort of at the boundary across systems, but then you could have almost like a complete black box test. So from the user perspective. So if the user does certain action that requires both systems to pitch in, then that's kind of tests you want to write them, uh, it's probably using Selenium, assuming there's a UI, and then you just emulate what the user would do, like you click something, you would type something, um, and then something should be a, a dis displayed. And then in that way, you can truly test that as a user, I'm able to perform the action that I need to do. So that, that's what we can do. But yeah, so that's assuming it's like a, a, a team um, or a set of multiple teams that all do TDD. But then in the case of where, you know, if you're the only team that does test, the other team doesn't, uh, I think that that gets a bit more complex because like, you can still write that, you know, black box Selenium test from the user perspective, but then it, I don't think it should be your team's responsibility to chase after other teams to say, okay, um, that thing break, but you know, it's beyond my control, can you fix it? Like, organizationally speaking, like, it might make sense to talk to um, one of the product director or the other product managers to figure out what is the best practice in that way, uh, in, the, in that situation to, um, to address that. Maybe, um, maybe it involves um, introducing testing to other parts of the application, in that case you could also probably uh, approach it from a um, uh, integration test perspective because um, although like it's, it's when we talk about black box tests you sort of know like as a system what this system is supposed to behave or what this application is supposed to behave so then you can write an integration test from the perspective of an API you say I'm making a, a post call with this kind of request and a body and then I expect certain response and then that kind of test is easy to get started with, uh, then to you know look at what kind of unit tests you can write for a code base that doesn't have any tests at all. Thank you. Cool. I guess it's the end. <laughs> I, I probably just hand it back to Michael to close. Yeah.